so as many of you know, the 200th anniversary of landscape designer Frederick Law Olmsted's birth is April 26, 2022. Um, Olmsted had a great influence on the public landscape in Rochester and um, events surrounding uh, his anniversary are being planned to celebrate his legacy. Uh, Caitlin Mives, Ma uh, Director of Preservation at the Landmark Society of Western New York, and Joanne Beck, President of Highland Park Conservancy, are involved in planning those events. And I'd like to thank them both for being here as co-presenters. Uh, our main presenter is Katie Eggers Como. Uh, she's architectural historian at Barrow Architecture. Katie received her Bachelor of Arts in the Humanities from Yale University and her Master of Science in Historic Preservation from the University of Pennsylvania. She's a member of Olmsted Parks Alliance and sits on the Five to Revive Committee of the Landmark Society of Western New York. Uh, she's the author of a 2013 article in the journal Rochester History on 125 years of Rochester Parks. She's also co-author of a book that was just released um, on the architecture of James H. Johnson. Uh, Johnson is the architect um, of Mushroom House fame, uh, but the book includes information and photos of all his works um, in the area and beyond. Um, and that's available uh, through the Greece Town Historical Society and Museum. So I can drop a link uh, to that in the chat also. Uh, so I am so glad to welcome Katie to our program. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. That is so nice. Now let's see if I can figure out how to do this. There we go. All right. I hope everyone is seeing my park slides there. Um, and I'll just ask if anyone is not on mute, go ahead and mute yourself just in case of any uh, untoward interruptions or anything like that. We're going to do um, questions at the end, so if you do have any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, I won't be watching those as we go, so you won't, don't worry about distracting me or anything like that, but we will get to them at the end of the program. So thanks, Mary, for that nice introduction. Um, I do love doing this presentation uh, toward the end of April because today happens to be Earth Day, as you know. It's also, as Mary mentioned, going to be Frederick Law Olmsted's 199th birthday next week on the 26th. Um, so this is a perfect time to do a presentation on parks, and especially when we've just had two days of snow. I'm sure we're all eager to see some beautiful pictures, and I promise there's, I believe, no snow in any of these pictures. So um, Rochester, as you may know, is one of just four cities in the United States that has a complete park system designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., who is recognized as the father of uh, landscape architecture, but really was much more than that, as we'll look at kind of briefly here. Uh, but our park system both began earlier than that in some ways and continued to evolve right up to the present. So we're going to look at precursors of the park system right up through some very recent developments. Um, because the meaning and kind of use of parks has changed over time. So we're going to look at how Rochester was uh, right at the forefront of a lot of those trends. So going back to the early days of Rochester as a European settlement on the Genesee River, um, there were some public areas set aside that eventually became part of our park system but didn't start out this, that way. So there were a number of small uh, little communities established along the Genesee River in different places where people thought might be a good place to um, have an eventual uh, city. Everyone had high hopes for the Genesee frontier. Um, and so in a, a number of these, they set up little uh, squares, usually not as public spaces, though, not meant to be parks, but meant to be courthouse sites. So the idea being that whichever of these little competing settlements ended up attracting the courthouse would be the one that would kind of win uh, and become the most prominent of the settlements along the Genesee River. So they couldn't all be chosen. And this is an example of one that, that wasn't, which became Washington Square. That's the one right downtown by Jiva and uh, First Universalist Church, St. Mary's Church. Um, and that's the square that you see on the left. So eventually those did become part of the park system and, and received uh, kind of nice landscape designs, as you see on the right there. 
keep pressing the right thing. There we go. Um, other public squares in Rochester began as real estate enhancements. So these were where developers of, of neighborhoods thought that it would make their particular little neighborhood more desirable and, and more expensive if they had a nice landscaped square. So this is Plymouth Square in the Cornhill neighborhood. So these were not really meant to be so much public amenities as kind of um, places where the residents could, uh, could enjoy some outdoor space. But eventually these did become public parks as part of our park system as well. Another uh, form of landscape that was not a park but was influential in the parks movement was the rural cemetery. And Mount Hope Cemetery is one of the best examples in the country of this cemetery style. This was whereas kind of um, in early days cemeteries were very practical kind of spaces around churches. The rural cemetery was on the outskirts of, of the city uh, and incorporated a lot of uh, rolling terrain and, and kind of beautiful lush landscapes that were meant to inspire a sense of contemplation. Um, and this on the upper, the upper photograph here shows how much earth moving was involved. Even though it was a beautiful, naturally hilly terrain, there was a lot of kind of sculpting of the land that went into creating that very beautiful environment. So these, as the city grew and became um, kind of more, more developed and more crowded, uh, the Mount Hope Cemetery, like other cemeteries, became a, a kind of used like a park. People would take their picnics there and go and enjoy the opportunity to be outside. And of course, in Rochester, we have this wonderful horticultural heritage with Elwanger and Barry and other nurserymen. They would lay out their grounds in a very beautiful way to kind of show what you could do with the plants that they were selling. And so that kind of inspired a, a lot of interest in, in plants and horticulture and landscape design here as well. So by the late 19th century, a whole number of factors had come together. In addition to the parks and squares and cemetery and horticulture, people started, at least middle class people, started to have some more leisure time um, and wanted to be in the outdoors. And Rochester was a, a progressive city. Um, and so, you know, a number of different factors came together and Rochester uh, city leaders decided it was a, a good time to develop a park system. And, and the immediate impetus for this was that Elwanger and Barry donated a sizable tract of land that had been part of their uh, nursery grounds as, uh, a, and said that that should be a public park and arboretum. So uh, Rochester's leaders looked around to see what might be done and decided, well, Buffalo has not just one park, but a whole park system. They actually had the first of the park systems designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. And so we were not going to be upstaged by Buffalo. So they decided it would be a good idea to have a similar park system here. They interviewed five different landscape architects and got ideas about what could be done and ended up hiring Frederick Law Olmsted, um, largely because of that experience he had had in Buffalo. And Olmsted is known as the father of landscape architecture, but he was a whole lot more than that. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on that because I do another whole presentation on Olmsted. But just to say that he tried a number of different careers, including literature and farming and um, many different things. He had a couple of very important roles in the Civil War. Uh, eventually, in his 40s, he um, ended up devoting the rest of his career to landscape architecture and really was a very important leader in that field. Um, so we are you know, thankful that he did eventually settle on that. And what he's most famous for, of course, is Central Park in New York City. Um, and he was both one of the designers of Central Park and also the superintendent in charge of carrying out the design. So he really had a very fundamental role in that. And part of what's so significant about Central Park is that um, the kind of the, the tradition of parks in Europe had been that they were land set aside for the nobility for hunting. So it was not a public space at all. It was really a private space. The word park, you know, referred to these private areas set aside for, um, for the nobility. But there was a park in England called Birkenhead Park that was the way we think of a park today, a public space for everyone to enjoy. And that was really the first such park, um, at least in, in Europe. There were no such parks in the United States at the time. Uh, and Olmsted saw that when he was traveling, was very much influenced by that. So when he had the opportunity to help with the design of Central Park, he was very, um, you know, interested in bringing those ideas to the United States. His parks were known as pleasure grounds, and so that was really an area set aside for and designed for passive recreation, meaning picnicking, strolling, enjoying the scenery. 
his idea was that city dwellers who spent all their time in very artificial environments with hard surfaces and right angles and everything constructed needed a chance to get away into a very different type of landscape where everything would be soft and curving and irregular and asymmetrical. Um, and, and that that was important for rest, restoring your soul when you spent so much time in, in urban environments. Um, and also he believed that these were important as democratic spaces where people of all different walks of life could see one another and have opportunities to mingle, which may, they may not have in their everyday normal life. So when he was designing any type of landscape, his first, uh, first thing he would think about was what he called the genius of the place. And that was some theme or idea or um, you know, aesthetic principle that was already there in the land that he would then amplify. So it wasn't a matter of just picking some beautiful land and putting a fence around it. That was not it at all. He would take that idea of what he already saw in the landscape and bring it out even more so. So if it was a, a park on a mountain like Mont Royal in Montreal, it was to amplify that sense of a mountain and the feeling of being on a mountain. If it was a, a gentle rolling terrain, you it may, maybe smooth that out, make it even more kind of rolling and, and gentle and serene. Some of the specific design features that he liked to employ were S-curves that would kind of draw you through the landscape in a, a way that it's always changing and making you wonder what's around the next curve. He liked to have different um, types of, of traffic at different levels. And so you see this if you've been to Central Park where you see the carriage drives and the pedestrian paths cross at, at different elevations on bridges and things. Um, and he liked everything to look very informal and naturalistic, even though it was actually very highly designed. So he didn't want, um, as you see in the, the smaller picture here, kind of the Italian or French uh, landscape style of everything being very manicured and symmetrical and, and geometric, uh, looking very artificial. He was more inspired by the landscapes of England, which of course were not entirely natural either. They were, you know, cultivated and, and changed over many generations, but had that much more informal, um, naturalistic kind of a look. So that's the kind of thing he was going for. So his recommendation to uh, the, the folks in Rochester was that they focus on creating three large parks, one to the north of downtown, one to the south, and then Highland Park on the land that had been donated and that these all be connected by uh, parkways, some of which were built and most of which ultimately were not. He was very interested in and strongly recommended that the city protect the river. He felt that the river was uh, an asset that was likely to be overdeveloped with industry if the city didn't act to protect it while they still could. And this is a, you know, a recent map of Rochester, but of course the city had not developed all the way out to where these parks were. They were kind of remote at the time, um, and some people thought too much so, but obviously the city has grown up around them. So to look really quickly at the original parks in the system, uh, the one on the land that was donated, of course, became Highland Park. There was a pre-existing reservoir there, um, and uh, that park, it actually Olmsted didn't really want to design Highland Park as much as he wanted to do the others because he didn't have there a natural water feature. He always wanted a natural lake or a river or something like that. Um, and the, the reservoir was a little too artificial for him. So his suggestion to the park commissioners was that they have his partner from Central Park, Calvert Vox, design Highland Park, and he would do the others. But they said, nope, you're going to do all of them or you're going to do none of them. So just to get you oriented here, along the south is Highland Avenue. And of course, that's the famous view of the lilacs looking up the hill there. The crowning uh, kind of pinnacle of the park was the Children's Pavilion. This was a, a gift from Al Wanger and Barry, built in 1890 and designed by a very famous um, architecture firm from Boston with Olmsted's direction. Um, and the kind of the idea behind the design was it was going to be an arboretum. That's what Al Wanger and Barry wanted to show off the, the horticultural tradition here and the, the wonderful plants that they were donating. And so in order to keep the views from the children's pavilion at the top to kind of preserve those views, everything was meant to be cut kind of low. So that's why you saw a lot of rhododendrons. Lilacs were not as big a feature originally as they became later, but of course that's what the park is famous for today. And the children's pavilion was unfortunately demolished in the 1960s, as you probably know, but the Highland Park Conservancy has been working on um, 
hope, hopefully rebuilding that in the next few years. So this is the, the rhododendrons looking up what was called rhododendron uh, valley, which if you were looking up where you're thinking of the lilacs on Highland Avenue, it's over a bit to the right of that. And then if, uh, part of the park that's not as well known but is very intact to the Olmsted design is the pinetum. So in this, in this view from the air, Highland Avenue is the road that kind of curves around the left hand upper left hand corner kind of similar to the shape of the reservoir and then this is on the other side of the hill um, and it's a, a very notable collection of uh, coniferous trees and shrubs. So uh, the next one I'll talk about was originally called North Park as kind of its temporary name and soon became called Seneca Park East and West. Now we know it as Seneca and Maplewood Parks. The goal here was to protect the dramatic scenery north of downtown along the gorge, where the gorge is very, um, has the, the gorge walls are steep, they're rocky in some parts, and um, so the challenge was how to uh, give people access to that scenery while making it safe. You know, you can't have people just running up to the edge of the gorge. Um, this was a familiar problem for uh, Olmsted because he had also designed the state park at Niagara Falls where obviously there's a huge problem of uh, providing safe access to scenery. Um, so this is an example of what Olmsted called a picturesque style park. And that's where you're meant to experience um, kind of the awe and wonder of nature. So the key uh, idea here was to preserve both sides of the gorge because obviously you don't really preserve views and, and things if you've only preserved one side. So that's why the park runs along both sides of the, the gorge and really for quite a long distance. For most of it, it's really just the walls of the gorge and people probably don't even realize that it's parkland along in there. There was meant to be a continuous uh, drive, a carriage drive, where people could go along the, the edge of the gorge as well as walking paths. And then in a few specific spots, several spots, there are these um, overlooks. This was kind of a, a natural area where the land bumped out and the idea was to keep the vegetation low so that you could always have that view. And you do have that view in kind of the fall and winter when the leaves are down, but in the, in the summer the trees have grown up quite a bit and so you, you don't really see the, the gorge that much from within Seneca Park, but that was what you were meant to be able to do. There's a couple spots where the land kind of opens up and uh, Lower Seneca Park is one of those. This is the Trout Pond area. And this is if you went past the zoo and kept going down into the park, you would come to the Trout Pond area. And this is actually not a natural pond. This was a constructed pond. But he, he wanted this to kind of provide this contrast to the drama of the River Gorge. The type of park that Olmsted really was famous for was the uh, pastoral style, which we have a wonderful example at Genesee Valley Park. And this, of course, is south of downtown where the river is much more gentle, the terrain is rolling, and um, much more serene. And Olmsted called this area almost ideal for a park. But again, he didn't just find an, a nice piece of land and put a fence around it. A lot of this involved massive moving of earth to shape the terrain exactly the way he wanted it, moving huge trees. There's photographs of them moving these enormous trees to create just exactly the effect that he wanted. And here's people doing exactly what you were meant to do in a pleasure ground park, which is just stroll and sit and immerse yourself in this beautiful scenery. Right from the start of our park system, there was kind of a, a change going on in, in how people were thinking of parks and kind of the I, I, ideals around how parks were going to be used. Um, and we were fortunate that even though this change was happening while our parks were still under construction, the folks who were overseeing the development of our parks were, in addition to the local park commissioners and park staff, the Olmsted firm stayed on as consultants to the park commission. And Olmsted himself, senior, was at the end of his career at, as he was doing our park system. So most of that work was taken over by his son and stepson who took over the firm. So they were pretty well positioned to both understand the pleasure ground philosophy and how to carry that forward, but also to understand the new trends in park design and how to integrate the two in a way that would hopefully allow a lot of that pleasure ground philosophy to remain while also kind of keeping up with the times. 
So the Reform Park movement was part of the greater progressive movement of the late, late years of the 19th century into the early 20th century. And this was the time when reformers were very concerned about the conditions in city neighborhoods that were increasingly crowded, um, had large immigrant populations who needed to adjust to life in the United States. So this is the time period of settlement houses and social activism around issues like child labor and programs to teach hygiene to you know, immigrant and lower, lower income families. So all part of that same general movement of both kind of trying to improve urban conditions, but kind of the, the darker flip side of that is, is trying to kind of um, assimilate immigrants into, by, by kind of teaching them American ways. It was kind of a, a bit of a, a paternalism there and assuming that uh, these reformers knew better than, than the immigrant families how to take care of their kids and how they should behave in the United States. So good and bad to this whole movement, but the parks were definitely part of that, specifically because the reforming type people were concerned about uh, children living in city neighborhoods, particularly immigrant kids in crowded neighborhoods who didn't necessarily have a lot of things to do um, and were playing in the streets. Um, so there was an increasing concern that parks needed to do more than just offer beautiful scenery that people could immerse themselves in, but offer more activities that would be interesting to kids and would keep them busy and would be constructive in terms of, of being educational and, and morally uplifting and so forth. So the park that kind of bore the brunt of this um, was Genesee Valley Park in terms of the existing parks. So this, this was both something that, that came about in, in new parks, which I'll talk about in a minute, but also in, in the existing parks, which hadn't even really been fully built at the time that this shift in philosophy was happening. So Genesee Valley Park, of course, was the obvious one for this because it was where you had that level terrain where you could add a number of different things that were um, you know, different from the original design idea. So Genesee Valley Park was also one where Olmsted did set aside an area for some more active recreation. And if you can see in the upper right hand corner, I actually can't see it because my own little image is over it, but you can see where Elmwood Avenue runs across here. And then the upper right hand corner north of the Elmwood Avenue bridge next to the river there, Olmsted did set aside an area for uh, boat houses because he knew that people were going to be interested in doing some boating activities on the river. So that was kind of the area that he set aside for more active recreation. But right away, even while the park was being uh, developed, there started to be a lot of pressure to add more recreational facilities to other parts of the park, and especially to have boathouses that would be south of the Elmwood Avenue Bridge, because that was the area that the private rowing clubs felt was the best for their purposes. It was where they could uh, build their where they could watch the races because the races were mostly going to happen in that area and they could sit on their on their decks or on their rooftops of, of their rowing clubs and watch the races. I think the water was considered better there for, because of currents or I don't know something I don't I don't know about rowing but that's where they wanted to build and so there was a lot of back and forth between Olmsted and um, the park commissioners as they would ask well what if we just put a couple boathouses here and he'd say no that's meant to be an open meadow the whole idea of that part of the park is that you should be able to look across to the east side and people on the east side can look across to the west and everyone's just seeing beautiful open scenery. But they said, well, okay, but if we did, what if we built it this way? And he'd say, no, nope, don't put it there. But eventually, of course, the park commissioners went out and there were boathouses all along that part of the river, which is what you see in the bottom photograph there. There's also a swimming pool, a track. Uh, baseball diamonds, you know, really a, a lot of, of active recreation in Genesee Valley Park. And that has remained the case today. So this is looking north on the river and on the left hand side of the river there you see the uh, waterway center. Um, but the right hand side does remain um, pretty much as Olmsted wanted it with just that, that pristine river scenery. I don't really want to talk a whole lot about the zoo, but just to show some early images of the types of um, enclosures that they had there early on, which were mainly just these little sort of temporary looking enclosures for native animals. The animals would be brought in in the summer and then moved out in the winter. And on, in the bottom photograph, you see what they call the flying cage. And so that was where they had uh, birds on display. One of the Olmsted sons visited and, and reported that these enclosures looked cheap, but were amusing to the visitors. 
So over time, of course, the zoo became uh, much larger and more permanent, but these were all up on, the flying cage didn't last very long, but other zoo enclosures were up kind of on a bluff where they weren't visible from the trout pond area until more recently as the, part, as the zoo has expanded um, kind of down into that area a little more. So another um, popular activity in the parks early on was music performances. They would play all kinds of especially patriotic music, uh, John Philip Sousa marches, things like that. These were um, highly conspicuous buildings. Um, they were very classical in design. They were not what Olmsted would have designed if he had designed them because he would have wanted something that would be kind of subordinate to the landscape and fit in and be kind of rustic in character instead of so classical. But um, I think if any of these sur did survive, we would probably enjoy them quite a bit now. The 19 teens and 20s were really the heyday for the park and there were activities uh, for all of the parks and there were activities in them all the time. There were May Day celebrations and music festivals. The upper right is a water carnival in Genesee Valley Park. The upper left is an early example of the lilac festival which started as kind of impromptu people just going to see the lilacs when they were in bloom. In addition to um, all the activities going on in the uh, existing parks, there were a number of new parks added to the system in this reform era of the early 20th century, one of which is Cobbs Hill Park. This was built around another res reservoir and also encompassed the former canal wide waters at uh, Lake Riley, which is at Culver Road right by the expressway. That was actually part of the canal before the canal was rerouted. The Olmsted firm did some design work for the city, uh, particularly some drives and plantings around the reservoir, but most of the park was not actually designed by the Olmsteads. And the, the um, gatehouse for the reservoir is an example of an another example of a kind of classical style building that Olmsted wouldn't have particularly um, wanted to see designed in quite that way, but it certainly is a beautiful uh, feature of our, of our parks. Another new park during this era was Durand Eastman Park. And this, I love this photograph because this really shows the extent to which land was moved and, and things were reshaped in order to create what ultimately looks like a very natural, untouched environment. Um, the Olmsteads had nothing to do with this park except a little bit of early um, advice from the Olmsted uh, firm. But Olmsted Sr. had died by the time this was acquired. so. People often think this was an Olmsted Park because the folks here in Rochester who carried this out were people who had really trained and learned under the Olmsted direction during the time that the Olmsteads were uh, carrying out the designs for the original parks. And so they really absorbed the Olmstedian philosophy very deeply and, and were able to create this park that really exemplifies that style even though it wasn't actually an Olmsted design. A very different kind of park that was added to the system in the uh, reform era was Edgerton Park. This had been a reform school in the 19th century and the city acquired the site after the school moved. So the city acquired it in 1911 and redeveloped it as what they called Exposition Park and that's because they held expositions which were like, like, like state fair type of events that highlighted the um, industry and economy of Rochester and Rochester culture. So they reused some of the buildings from the reform school and added some as well. So here's uh, showing one of these expositions underway where you have a bandstand in the lower right and then some of these reused buildings forming uh, kind of that, that uh, shape around it. It was renamed Edgerton Park in 1922 after um, Mayor Edgerton died. And it was the incubator for many institutions in Rochester, many of our cultural institutions, including Rundell Library, Rochester Museum and Science Center, the Rochester Historical Society. There was a zoo, there was an aquarium. This was a really good example of the types of cultural amenities uh, that were associated with this early 20th century reform era. Another example of a, a new reform park in this time period was Ontario Beach Park. This had been the Coney Island of Western New York in the 19th and early 20th centuries. It had rides and midway. It was really quite an amusement park with uh, hotels, beer gardens. Um, it was outside the city at that time in the village of Charlotte, which was an independent um, village at the time. And so reform 
reform minded people were very concerned that this place kind of outside the, the limits of city police power and things was becoming a bit uh, disreputable. And they were concerned that liquor laws were not being enforced, that there were houses of ill repute and beer gardens and all, all kinds of things going on there that were considered kind of unsavory by these middle class reformers. This is the, uh, the amusement park in its heyday. It was very popular, but by the 1910s, it was becoming kind of a little bit run down. There'd been some fires and um, some maintenance issues going on. So the city acquired uh, this land when they annexed Charlotte in 1916, and they pretty much took everything down except the carousel. So the hotels, the rides, it became a much more sedate uh, waterfront park with really the beach and um, some picnic pavilions and, and picnic benches and things like that. It meant more for kind of wholesome family, um, outdoor, uh, serene entertainment rather than kind of the little bit more um, you know, CD activities in the minds of these reformers. Smaller parks and playgrounds were really important to reformers because they felt that all these, all the children living in the city really needed to have easy access to some place where they could play outside. It needed to be easy for their parents or caretakers to take them there. Uh, so <clears throat> this could be done with our existing small parks and squares and, and with additional new parks and playgrounds added at the, as, as well. The idea of a playground at that time was pretty different from what we think of today, where today it's really kind of just equipment where you go and play as, as you want to. But at that time, it was a very supervised system. You sort of were like almost like a member of a playground. You might be on a, a team organized through the playground. And you can see in this, in this quote that they talked about the children being mothered and fathered and taught to play and many good things. And again, this is that kind of paternalistic attitude that maybe um, lower income children or immigrant families don't really know how to teach their kids how to play properly. Um, but, you know, it was definitely having a lot of a lot of things for these kids to do. And they were very, very popular. Um, here's a, an example of a librarian who came from the library with her books and was was reading to all these children. They did keep track of these things because it was so organized with, you know, paid staff supervising all these activities. They found that uh, in 1911, they had an average of 12,000 children a week um, attending uh, the playground activities and sometimes 2,500 on a single day. So they were definitely very well attended and popular. Brown Square, which was one of the early, one of those early city squares that I mentioned right at the very beginning, um, was redeveloped during this time as a model playground. Um, so it was, it had all the latest equipment, um, kind of all, that was the most uh, up-to-date and popular in playground design. There was uh, areas for outdoor games and gymnastics. There was equipment, as you see there. There was a field house that had um, an indoor gym, showers, restrooms, a branch of the library, and meeting space. Um, there were waiting pools. There was seating where the parents could watch the kids. This was really considered a national model of this type of playground. Um, and the it's very different, you know, obviously from what was intended with the pleasure ground parks where aesthetics were kind of at the forefront. Here it's really not about aesthetics. It's about fitting as much of this um, educational and, and wholesome, you know, equipment and, and amenities into the park as you possibly can. So that whole era came to a rather sudden end with the onset of the Great Depression. There's no more money to build model playgrounds or, or you know, employ staff to run all those activities anymore. Uh, massive funding cuts, of course, in parks at all levels. But then, as the, you know, as we got a few years into the depression, the state and federal uh, work relief programs put a whole lot more money and manpower into the parks. Um, and parks projects were very popular with the, the CCC and other programs, building things like what you see here. None of these are actually in Rochester. The one on the left is in Ithaca. The others are from other parts of the country. but. Um, they're, they're meant to show kind of the, the aesthetic that was popular at that time, where it's, it's very rustic and kind of blending into the landscape, more unsteady and really than what had been done in the reform era. And we have modest examples of this in Rochester. This is a park shelter in Genesee Valley Park. There are several of these there as well as in, Highland, or in um, Seneca Park. Not everything um, done during this time period under these work relief programs 
had that rustic aesthetic. This is the Ontario Beach Bathhouse, which is much more classical in design, but was another uh, one of these uh, work relief projects. As was the Veterans Memorial Bridge, this is the bridge that now carries Route 104 over the river. And so you've got Maplewood Park in the um, upper left side there, uh, and then the Seneca Park side is on the right hand side. Um, this was really designed to be an amenity to the park that was linking the two sides together. It was meant to be a kind of a parkway. And you can really see that with that landscaped, well, not yet landscaped, but laid out to be landscaped traffic circle that that's got a very uh, deliberate uh, landscape design to it. Uh, less so on the west side where even in this version it did cut right through that that uh, section of Maplewood Park. Um, but uh, it, it wasn't as disruptive as it became later when the Keeler Street Expressway was built. That's 104 that really bisects the park right through here. So that era uh, likewise came to an end with World War II. Um, when you know all hands were on deck for the war effort and that included putting the parks into the war effort so this is Cobbs Hill Park uh, where there was a, <clears throat> a POW camp there were also Victory Garden gardens built in the parks but you know aside from that there really wasn't a lot of uh, park design or planning going on obviously during the war after the war we had you know the period of of suburbanization, of you know all kinds of government incentives luring uh, white middle class families out to the suburbs, um, and rapid development of suburban areas. This is Levittown, but obviously we have that type of development in the Rochester suburbs as well. So this was when the county park system started developing, and I'm not going to talk about that. It's not something I know a lot about, but a very different type of um, type of system. And as far as the city parks went, um, there was no more flowery language about improving um, morality or being educational or anything like that. It was really all about responding to demand for what type of things people wanted to see in the parks. If they wanted um, more tennis courts, then you know the, the park planners felt they needed to provide more tennis courts. If it was basketball, provide basketball. If it's soccer, provide soccer. Um, and so there's much more of an emphasis throughout this era when you look at the, the park reports on statistics and measuring things and how far does everybody live from a playground, how many baseball diamonds are there per capita, things like that. There's also emphasis on programming around a couple of specific groups, specifically teenagers. Teenagers hadn't really, had not really been a kind of a separate demographic category that people thought about much until the 50s and 60s and also uh, senior citizens. So the Danforth Recreation Center, in, which is a part of the park system in Rochester, offered a lot of programming for seniors. I don't know exactly what they're doing here, but um, this is at the Danforth Recreation Center. And of course, as we are all very familiar with, um, the issue of funding for parks was a perpetual issue. Uh, park budgets really never returned to where they were in the pre-war level, you know, the pre-war um, era when they, they could have enough money to have people, you know, supervising playgrounds all the time and things like that. It became difficult to even just do basic maintenance in the parks because there were so many competing um, interests and, you know, just the whole budget situation was very different after the war than it had been before. So to the extent that things were changed in the parks, a lot of the time it was about um, safety and maintenance. So here we have uh, at Ontario Beach Park a sign heralding a sign of progress being that more blacktop was being installed in the park. Um, and of course this is about safety, ease of maintenance. Um, now it would be more about accessibility, which is a positive thing of course, but um, a lot of a lot of the changes were about you know safety or at least the perception of safety. So things like removing trees and shrubs to eliminate uh, places people might think would be hiding places, adding more lighting. You know really some changes that, while maybe well intentioned, had some significant impacts um, on the you know the look of the parks, and of course the need to accommodate um, the automobile. You know before. World War II, people pretty much went to the parks by streetcar um, if they couldn't walk. But after the war, everyone went everywhere by car. And so here's another sign of progress, which is adding more parking. I'm not sure that's progress, but um, that uh, was, was considered to be progress. Of course, it's very difficult to um, accommodate 
you know, the need for everyone to come in an automobile if you've got a park that's meant to be a naturalistic kind of space. Things that were built in the parks uh, reflected a stripped down kind of modernist aesthetic of the time, both because it was popular and because these buildings that had uh, less ornament were easier to maintain. This was a short-lived skating shelter built in Genesee Valley Park, and it was by the prominent local architect C. Stores Barrows. The rink never seems to have actually worked very well, and so this building didn't last very long either. Um, and then, unfortunately, there's been the ongoing tendency to uh, see parks as being free land that's available for other um, pressing public needs. So, for example, you know, there was a, a legitimate need to provide um, affordable housing, and particularly housing for elderly people. Um, and there are a lot of ways this could have been accomplished, but the way it was accomplished in a number of cases was to build um, these housing projects or housing complexes right in uh, the parks because the land was perceived as being available and, and not being used for anything else, even though parks are, of course, a use. Um, so, you know, that's a that's a, a way, one way to balance interests, I suppose, but what became even more unfortunate about this over time is when these became gateways for private um, residential development more recently, which is more difficult to justify as a, uh, a use of a public space. Of course, that's nothing new. That, that kind of way of treating parks goes back to at least the early 20th century when the uh, Erie Canal was rerouted out of downtown Rochester and the kind of path of least resistance was to put it right through Genesee Valley Park. Uh, where there wouldn't have to be a lot of you know land acquired or buildings demolished and so that was the first time Genesee Valley Park was cut into by a kind of transportation development. The When that was done the Olmsted firm was still working with the Rochester Park Commission and so they worked to reconnect the circulation system that had been severed and so these beautiful concrete bow bridges were uh, part of that solution. But unfortunately, when the expressway went through the park in the 1970s, it was not so easy to find a similarly compatible solution. And that really became a much more intrusive um, way of severing the park. It creates a lot of noise and pollution and just a very significant barrier there that is not really possible to overcome that. But what did happen with that was it helped galvanize interest in the Olmsted parks. So as a preservation loss often does, that, that had that effect. So we also have in Rochester, um, I showed a, a kind of a minor example of modernist design, but we have a, a full-on masterpiece of modernist landscape architecture in Rochester, which was originally known as Manhattan Square Park and is now Martin Luther King Jr. Park. Um, this was uh, designed by Lawrence Halperin, who was one of the recognized masters of landscape architecture in the modernist period. And this was designed as part of the uh, vast uh, reconsideration and re re uh, redesign, I guess, of the southeast section of downtown Rochester, which is, if you look around there, it's mostly new buildings. But what it was meant to really be was kind of an outdoor living room for a new neighborhood that was envisioned, where these high-rise um, apartment complexes were meant to kind of ring around that, and this would be their outdoor living room. So that was the reasoning behind having this multi-level design with the space frame and this terraced um, water feature, which is really a very, very interesting, um, interesting design. Unfortunately, that... Um, neighborhood never really materialized, so this park has not really had the constituency it was meant to have. Park philosophy has continued to evolve, and I'm going to just touch on a couple of different trends we've seen in the last few decades. One has been the rediscovery of Olmsted. There are Olmsted parks that have been neglected, and there are others that have been uh, kind of loved to death, like Central Park, which is in these photographs. And so um, there's been uh, increasing attention to the need to Think of these not as um, you know places to just run all over willy-nilly, but as works of art that need to be protected and uh, treated as such. We haven't had a ton of uh, park restoration work in Rochester. Probably the best example would be after the 1991 ice storm when um, the uh, when two million dollars went into Seneca Park to restore that and in, uh, in keeping with the Olmsted design.
This is a really interesting, more recent example in Boston, um, where there's there was recognition that Olmsted's principles could be used to help solve modern issues um, relating to water quality improvement, flood control, other things like that. So this is was the Muddy River, which is in the the historic photo in the inset there. That became what you see in the larger photo, which is it was on the right hand side is the Sears building. So this area became a parking lot. The river was covered over and was a parking lot, which then when Sears left became this kind of grassy space. And so the Sears building in this photograph is on the left. So you're kind of looking from the other direction. But this was a massive construction project that took many years right in the heart of Boston. Um, so that former grassy previous parking lot is under construction here to bring back the Muddy River. And this photo I took in 2016, this was right after the, um, the uh, kind of construction fencing had come down. And so the, the landscaping hadn't really, the vegetation hadn't grown in yet. So I should really get a more, uh, more recent photograph. But this was recognition that Olmsted's idea about how to turn what had been this industrialized waterway into this verdant kind of stream, as you saw in the Muddy River photo, could those same principles still apply today, even more so when we have even greater issues around flood control and, and water quality and things like that. And so, you know, Olmsted wasn't thinking about climate change, but we can think about it today and think about how Olmsted's principles might apply to a lot of the same issues that we're facing today. In Rochester, this is uh, Genesee Valley Park West, where I was part of a team that was rethinking how that area, which has been um, overrun with um, lots of, you know, well-loved, but um, not in keeping with the original design intent, uh, recreational facilities, how that might over time evolve into something a little bit closer to Olmsted's design, where maybe the the, the um, more active um, buildings and things could go north of the Elmwood Avenue Bridge where Olmsted intended them, and um, some of the other areas could be in a little bit more green kind of condition. And as Mary mentioned, we do have Olmsted's 199th birthday next week, which means his 200th birthday is in a year. So we'll be hearing more about um, ways to celebrate the ongoing uh, importance of his legacy. Another uh, trend I want to touch on real quick is um, one that actually is sort of the opposite of what Olmsted had in mind. This was a uh, trestle along the Genesee River north of downtown, which was a transfer point for uh, rail and river industry. This is the type of industrial development that Olmsted was concerned about. But rather than eliminating it all today, we might and have been thinking about how to incorporate remnants of that type of infrastructure into new parkland. So I think Joanne was involved with this project, which is Turning Point Park, where they took the remnants of that old infrastructure and turned it into a new way to enjoy um, the river and also appreciate those industrial artifacts. And of course, the High Line in uh, New York City, an even more, much more famous example of that, but we have our own example in Rochester. This is the Brickyard Trail in, in Brighton, which does something similar in turning an old um, brickyard area into a, a trail where there's interpretive signage and then these, these brick benches are also interpretive elements that have um, information etched in them so that you can understand how much brick was produced here. And the trail itself goes on a um, kind of an embankment that was built for the, um, as part of that brick industry. So over all of that time, you know, there are so many different types of parks as we've looked at. The image on the right shows a, a survey I worked on and all those little dots represent elements in the Rochester park system. Everything from little street malls to the vast, um, you know, the vast large parks. Um, and so there's been a lot of different ways of thinking about parks and ways to use parks and different types of ways of developing parks, but they all share that common purpose of helping people experience the outdoors close to where they live in an urban environment um, in lots of different ways. And so we're very lucky to have that, uh, that legacy here that helps make our city so much more livable and enjoyable. And with that, um, I guess I will stop sharing. Let's see if I can do that. And yes, there we go. And um, Mary or Caitlin, if you want to take it away with the Q&A, we can go on to that.
Hey, thank you so much, Katie. That was really interesting. And, uh, and, and we'll open it up to anyone who has questions. Um, uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask, or if you put them in the, the chat, we can, we can take questions there also. And I'll, while folks are thinking of their questions, I'll go ahead and pose a question to, um, to Katie. And we also have Joanne Beck, who, um, in addition to being the president of the Highland Park Conservancy, Conservancy is also a retired landscape architect who worked for the city of Rochester and was involved in some of the more modern uh, rehabilitations of some of the parks that you saw. Um, so for Joanne and Katie, you know, a, an issue that we've seen kind of come to the fore, a topic we've seen come to the fore in the last year with COVID um, is, you know, how, is the realization that parks are such an important part of our community, especially urban communities. Um, and they're such an important resource, but also the whole idea of there being equitable access to parks for all types of folks. How do you think, um, do you think that we provide equitable access here in Rochester, especially maybe compared to other cities? I know, you know, there've been studies that show in some communities that poor, you know, non-white communities have less access. How do you think Rochester does? The, the equity and health were fundamental values that went into the design of our original Olmsted Park system and the expansion of the, of the park system. So they're, they're just intrinsic values and design is only, I mean, it's not, it's not only, but, but design is the physical expression of values modified by whatever resources you can bring to bear. But basically it comes down to values and Katie, Katie really, um, really talked about how the values changed and, the, and, and that, and that changed what was built and how it was built. And so to me, this last year has really um, shown how we need, we need um, access to nature and we have it. <laughs> and it would be nice if we recognized the importance of that resource and really thought about how we can preserve it for generations to come. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think framing it as, you know, the parks are just like a fun, nice thing. It's like, it's a, you know, uh, uh, it should be, I think I was reading an article today that said, you know, we should think of parks as like critical public infrastructure, just like water and sewer. Um, because it, they are, they can be so essential to, you know, individuals' health and well-being. Well, I, I think that the last year has, has really taught us that because when when the original parks were built, that was before antibiotics were available. People thought that you maintained your health by having fresh air and sunshine. And lo and behold, the antibiotics weren't available for what we went through and people needed fresh air and sunshine. <laughs> Any other, anybody want to pop a question into the chat or unmute yourself? And we've got, these are like the resident uh, parks experts here. So take this opportunity to pick their brain. Um, I'm, can I talk? Yes. I'm, I'm very curious about the relationship between the University of Rochester um, and Genesee Park, Valley Park, because they're right next to each other. Was that always that true when Olmsted designed the park? No, it was, uh, so if I'm remembering the chronology right here, it, it, uh, Oak Hill golf, golf course was there, although I don't know the date of that, but I know that was, there was a kind of a, a switch there. Um, so the, the university wasn't there yet, but moved over there in the early 20th century. 
I think. <laughs> I feel like I should know the date. I know, uh, I'm blanking on that. I know. And it's been, um, it's, you know, today that the, um, well, maybe Joanne can talk kind of about how the trails continue right through the university. And so there's been that, but there's also, of course, been the university eyeing the park for expansion at times. Um, well, actually, yes. The Genesee Valley Park on the east side of the river, south of the south of the um, university. Um, if you look at the original plan, you see that there was an intent for Genesee Valley Park to extend along the along the riverside up to Ford Street, and in fact, that is there. It's called Bausch and Lomb Park now. Right. Right. So, um, so the university abuts the park. The park is between the university and the and the river. And at one point, um, probably in the '60s, the city of Rochester gave Tennessee Valley Park East, north of the canal, to the university for an expansion of their, I think, their law school, and. Um, in the, uh, in the 1980s, there was a plan called the South River Corridor Plan um, where that was, all, that was all reconsidered. And in fact, that section of the park or most of that section of the park went back into public ownership. And, um, and after that, the county did a, a, a plan to reestablish with, with proper historic consultants to reestablish the Olmstead landscape in the in the, the remaining part of Genesee Valley in that section. So we have a, a good question in the chat from Judy. She says, Katie, thanks for an excellent presentation. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, did Rochester have de facto segregation? If so, what parks did people of color use? Well, there was certainly um, residential segregation, as we're you know learning more and more about now in terms of uh, restrictive covenants and and things like that. In the 19th century, Rochester had a very small African American population, and so the issues around segregation didn't become as big of a, a an issue until the Great Migration, when the African American population began to get larger and the white population began to push back against that by implementing things like um, the, you know, the restrictive covenants around where people could buy houses and things like that. Um, as far as I know, the parks never had any kind of uh, formal segregation. Whether folks felt comfortable, that, I, you know, I don't know. I, that would be an interesting topic to look into a little bit more. Um, but, you know, certainly Olmsted was working in a time when um, Racial equity was not, uh, you know, not something people were thinking about. He was thinking more about um, democracy and, uh, you know, class um, class issues, people having an opportunity to interact. But he was a very strong abolitionist. Um, he wrote, uh, art, he went to travel in the South and wrote articles before the Civil War that were very influential, were put into a book that, um, was uh, part of the reason that England did not intervene in the Civil War on behalf of the Confederacy, because they read his book about what the uh, South was really like. But I think, as we know, an abolitionist in the 19th century is not really the same as an anti-racist of the 21st century. So um, how his specific views would, would hold up today, I don't know. Um, and I'm sure that things could have been um, could have been uh, better in terms of, of equity and, and uh, you know, segregation in the parks, but it's not something that I've looked at um, extremely specifically. Um, certainly, it's always, it's always been the case that there are more parks in kind of better off areas, but that's kind of a chicken and egg situation because, you know, a lot of those areas became the more desirable areas because there were these beautiful parks. I have a question, um, and that is, what what do you think of the uh, take in, take out? You know, the the lack of, of garbage cans, that kind of thing. And I think that's a good question for our former public uh, employee. <laughs> <Joanne>. <laughs> 
No, um, Katie, Katie really told us about uh, the change in priorities in, you know, budgeting and um, I think it, I think it's, it's, it's basically trying to make do with uh, the meager budgets that the parks have, they, you know, they have only been reduced uh, in modern times. There is there, you know, there have been capital projects, but operating budgets um, in, in the public realm have only been reduced. And that's, those are the, the kinds of adjustments that you see. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the whole idea of, you know, how do we value our parks? Are they, you know, essential public infrastructure? Um, another question we have in the chat, can you share your thoughts on balancing access and enjoyment with preservation and protection? Um, and I'll just, you know, say, you know, I remember um, when I was in grad school uh, for historic preservation, you know, we spent some time talking about this very issue, looking particularly at heavy use parks like um, Central Park um, in, in New York. And, you know, it is just that, right? It's, it's a balance. Um, and it's, I remember at that time thinking, man, it really seems like these active recreation opportunities seem to always win out. In this balance, so maybe it's not quite such a balance, but uh, but I'd be curious what you, what Katie and Joanne think. It's just that, and you know, it's just it's just a balance. I know, I know, in the uh, the rehab of Central Park has involved um, more control over. Um, like uh, concerts in the park, in the '70s they 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 had um, in the '70s there were there were all these uh, really huge events, demonstrations, concerts that just trashed Central Park. And now that um, there's been a concerted effort by Central Park Conservancy to restore the park landscape, restore the turf, and and you know, pay attention to the quality of experience. Those things are not; those things are not allowed uh, at at that scale. So, um, it's it comes down to management, and it comes down to um, what are the values that the of the community. I have a question. Uh, I was married at the U of R Chapel in uh, 1970, and I had, and then we went over to the park. Now here's a picture of uh, the the uh, what where we took it, but I don't know where that is in the park. Do you know where that is? There's a bridge, but I don't know which bridge it is or anything like that. Oh. I think, I think we'd have to see it. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's hard, hard to see in the picture. But oh. this, but this does remind me, the, um, the National Association of Olmsted Parks has launched a website, um, www.olmsted200 in celebration of the 200th, the 200th anniversary of Frederick Law Olmsted. And one of their, one of the features of the website is share your Olmsted story. And so they're inviting people to send in photographs, send in memories that they um, treasure from their experience in the Olmsted parks. And, and to me, it just, uh, these, these places are so um, profoundly um, important in so many ways to us, it, it, to me, that was a that was a great addition to their website. So, and, so upload your photo to um, www Olmsted two hundred. Okay, yeah. I will. thank you. <laughs> and and you know, if you want to send us an email, you can email um, info at landmarksociety.org, and I can share that image with with Katie and Joanne, and we'll see if we can do some uh, visual detective work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, Katie and Joanne, uh, in the chat, we have a question. What are each of the panelists' favorite Rochester parks? And I'm going to make you two go first. I don't know. 
<laughs> Katie, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, you know, I think what's so special about our system is that um, when you think about the, the original Olmstead parks, at least, he was able to have different parks each have its own distinct um, style. So whereas in some place where he was only designing one park, he would kind of combine everything. What was really neat was that here he could have one park devoted to picturesque and one to the pastoral. So it's hard to pick a favorite because it kind of depends. But I'm going to go, I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm going to say um, probably Seneca Park because um, I grew up not really ever having gone past the zoo, which I think is probably a lot of people's experience, unfortunately. And so when I moved back to Rochester and it was, I was working at the Landmark Society at the time and it was uh, the one of the series of zoo expansion controversies. So that's when I got, uh, you know, that's when I kind of learned so much and with Joanne and other people helping me about um, the history of the parks and that we had this incredible resource that if you go past the zoo, you've got this this amazing landscape that just opens up um, in front of you that I, I just didn't know about as a kid. So I think having worked, you know, spent so much time working on Seneca Park, I have to say that's that's probably my favorite. I have a sort I have an answer. I'm gonna say um, because I'm a sucker for underappreciated things, I have become, especially after taking a walking tour from Joanne, I became a big fan of Manhattan Square Park slash the new the now renamed Martin Luther King Jr. Park. Um, just because it's um, it's modern and funky and cool. So, so I live on Seneca Parkway, which is on the Olmstead plan <laughs> as the entrance to Seneca Park. So I'm literally invested in Seneca Park, <laughs> the Maplewood side. But I think my most cherished memory is, and I'm the president of Highland Park Conservancy, my most cherished memory was right after we moved to Rochester my 10 year old son was absolutely heartbroken to leave our old home. He was really suffering. He was so, um, he was just heartbroken. And I took him on a walk in Highland Park and he went running up and down the, the lawns and in and out, in and out between. And he just had this wonderful, um, he just loved it. And then when, when we invited our friends from our old home here, that is where he wanted to take them. And so um, that just communicated to me how really important for, uh, for well-being uh, these, these places are. Mary, do we have time for another question? What's our, what's our end time? Um, we we can do, I see there's one last question in the chat, so why don't we end up with that one? Uh, it's, if if you could put a new park somewhere in Rochester, where would you want to see a new park? Hmm. You know, hmm, that's interesting. I, well, I have two answers. Well, no, no, I have an answer. I think probably, you know, so as we've, ex as we experienced white flight and disinvestment from, from particularly um, from, from the city, but particularly um, what today are some of our lower income neighborhoods that have experienced the most disinvestment um, in the Northeast quadrant, um, I'd say, and we've also experienced then some de demolition of housing stock, um, you know, maybe there are formal and former industrial sites, or, um, or you know, areas where buildings were demolished that could be repurposed. I mean, it's always good to see building construction where buildings used to be, um, but maybe you know, in a community that could really use more access to a public park. Um, one, maybe one in particular that comes to mind is in the Plex neighborhood along the river, where the former vacuum oil, a highly contaminated site um, complex, used to be. Yeah, I was thinking about the Northeast Quadrant too, because if I could pull up um, again the map that showed um, the little dots for all the parks, um, uh, 
there there certainly are not as many in the northeast part of the city and partly that's because that area hadn't um i mean that was just really out there at the time of um when you know when the, the parks are being developed but certainly today that's a um very developed neighborhood where there's not a not a ton of parks pulaski park is up there and that's a very interesting site for anyone who hasn't seen that that's that's a very surprising little park um but there there probably could be more up in that part of the city I think that, um, you know, there was a plan, uh, an Olmsted Brothers Brunner plan um, that was developed for the city that linked, uh, that showed a lot of links between the, the parks, um, parkways and, um, and really there was a, a, green, a greenway across the Pinnacle Range from Mount Hope over to Rondequoit Bay. And um, we have had, I'd like to see some of those plans revisited and um, finally uh, built. Uh, thank you so much. This, it was such a, uh, an informative uh, presentation, Katie and Joanne and Caitlin. It was just great having your input and, uh, and uh, thank you so much. Well, so, thank you. Uh, and thank, thank you everyone for attending and I uh, uh, hope you have a wonderful night. Yes, Thanks. happy birthday. Bye. Okay, thank you. Thank Bye. everyone for coming.